Welcome to the Pro Cheerleading Podcast. This is the only podcast that gives you a raw and unfiltered perspective of what it's really like to be a professional cheerleader. Whether you're currently on a pro team, an alumni, or really curious about what it takes to become a pro cheerleader, the Pro Cheerleading Podcast gives you all the inside scoop and hot topics in the pro cheerleading industry and in-depth interviews of current and former cheerleaders. I'm your host, Makiba. Join me every Wednesday as I reveal the truth behind the palms. You guys, today is the season seven finale, and I can't believe we're already here in 2021. I can't believe that I've wrapped up another season, but I'm really excited nonetheless to share this last episode with you guys. It's called Union. I couldn't hold it in anymore. I basically had to let you guys know what this uh, last episode was going to be about um, because I'm just so excited. This has been something that I've wanted to do, frankly, since I started the podcast, and so it's just really, really exciting, and I'm so proud of the episode and super excited about the content. So we'll get into some cheer chat, and then I will you know, kick it over to the panel discussion. You are going to learn a lot about what unionization is all about, and I hope it generates a lot of questions and just interest because I think it's just something that we need to do, period. But it's totally up to you guys who are currently in the NFL to move in this direction. But let's go into cheer chat. I have to admit I'm a little salty because it is NFL playoffs. It's such an exciting time. And my team just kind of, man, that was not a fun little game to watch because I don't know. It's just disappointing. I know that if it was not the Rona, then we would have been like so loud. Like the, we just need that energy in our field. Like, I don't know if they changed the name. It's Lumen Field now, but it was just missing that playoff vibe. You know what I mean? Where it's just like people going crazy. And I mean, we're cheerleaders and everything, but I feel like we absolutely with our fans influenced the game, and especially when it came down to playoffs. So it was just so hard watching the Seahawks play here in Seattle and no fans. We just fell flat and it was sad. I'm still sad, but I'm excited for all of the cheerleading teams that are left in the playoffs. I hope you guys have an amazing journey that, you know, you are able to get involved with, you know, appearances and just hyping up the public, just getting into the excitement of the playoffs. I know that that's a a big deal and there's some exciting teams that are in the playoffs. I can't believe the Browns just punked the Steelers like that. Mm. Anyway, it's juicy. I'm just going to be trying to go for the underdog at this point. But, you know, our season is coming to a close for a lot of people um, who obviously aren't in the playoffs. And, you know, I hope in looking back at deciding to audition this year and going through the season, even though it wasn't like the normal experience cheering in the NFL, I hope you found it rewarding. I hope that it was worth it to you. I hope that you you know, managed to stay safe and felt like it was a, a good idea, good experience. Let's hope for nothing else was not the most ideal situation, but I'm proud of everybody that that went for their dreams anyway and made it work. And hopefully the 2021 season, especially in terms of auditions, will yield a different result so that everybody's just kind of moving towards the new normal for NFL cheerleading in more ways than one. But obviously, you know, having auditions and being able to be a little bit more incorporated into games as hopefully the vaccine rolls out and people end up hopefully moving into different stages of reopening their cities and their stadiums. I hope that NFL cheerleaders have a better season next season, for sure. But, you know, as I was reflecting, because this is the season seven finale, I just want to say a huge thank you to you guys, obviously, for listening and bearing with me. You know, this past summer obviously was crazy and we had a few episodes and it was a a limping along kind of season six, but you guys definitely kicked back in and enjoy the ride of season seven. You know, I just had a lot of episodes that I just really was excited to put together because they're just things that I've, like I said, wanted for a long time. So I just want to give a shout out to everybody that I interviewed. Um, kicking off the season with Sabrina Ellison from the Warriors was just like, wow. I mean, you know, she's amazing and being so willing to do an interview for the episode was just really a huge honor for me and it was a great way to start off the season. Um, I just actually joined. I couldn't stay for the whole thing, but if you guys aren't aware, go follow this Instagram handle, 
the Cultivate Code. It is a new program that Sabrina and Amira Murad, I hope I'm saying her last name correctly, but they just launched and it's a mentoring program. And as far as I can tell, it was free, but um, they had a webinar today. It was an hour long and I can only say for the first 30 minutes, but you guys to be able to get any sort of mentoring tips and advice on just being your best self, unleashing your code, I think is what I gathered before I had to leave, but just offering just words of wisdom that I think will help you not just in your dance career and improving as a performer, but also in life. I mean, I felt energized and really, really wish I could have stayed on longer, but definitely follow uh, the Cultivate Code and stay tuned to see what else is in store for the program. I definitely hope to catch up with her um, during the break and find out more information because I think it's just an awesome, awesome program. It sounds great to be mentored by some of the best in the game. You can't beat it. Just soak it up. I mean, anybody who's willing to impart their knowledge and their experience, it's an honor and a privilege. So take advantage of it. And you guys, just for the record, please tag me and stuff because I don't want to miss anything. And I'm more than happy to reshare, repost what you are up to. If you have programs going on, if you're teaching class, it helps me out a ton. I'm happy to share it out, but please just tag me so I can see it. But yeah, thank you, Sabrina, obviously, for helping kick off season seven. And I want to thank Sarah Yarbrough for coming on and talking about, you know, just a difficult journey dealing with domestic violence. It was her platform as a beauty pageant contestant. Uh, but it was great to talk to her about her cheerleading background. I'm just giving you a little rundown of season seven, but I just want to thank everybody individually. And if you miss any episodes, go back and take a listen. Um, Kayla Marie Jackson, who I love saying her full name, a super amazingly talented performer former Atlanta Hawks dancer and just handling it in the commercial dance stage. She teaches classes as well. So talented. And she drops so many jewels about transitioning from your pro to your career into being booked as a commercial dancer. I mean, that was broken down into two episodes just to give you all the scoop and all the skinny. It was just too many, too many jewels of wisdom to, uh, to trim down, but please go check that out. And thank you, Kayla, for giving your time. And we also interviewed Christy along with the Brooklynettes. I mean, just, whoa, another powerhouse director in the NBA that agreed to share uh, her time with the podcast and talk about you know, her approach to leading the Brooklynettes teams and all the other entertainment teams. And it's just really cool meeting her because I really like what they're doing with their program. I think it's very unique. After the doing the NBA dance team playoffs, they definitely were a team that stuck out to me, and I'm sure you guys all enjoyed their performances as well. So thank you, Christina, for coming on to the Pochoding Podcast. My hair episode with my hair was another one of my, like, dream episodes, and I just want to take time to thank the panelists that joined for that, Kira Dior, Mariah Lewis, and Rosemary Sandu, um, all super talented hairstylists and entrepreneurs that are just killing the hair, pro hair game. I mean, we all love our hair. And I just thought it was great to hear about how they launched their businesses, the different concerns people have with their hair, especially as a performer. So that's my baby. I'm still so proud of that one because it was just something like, how do I get the right people to make these episodes come to life? And Whip My Hair was just something that I've wanted to do forever. Uh, also want to thank Marcus Sophus. Another super talented dancer and performer, formerly with the Dallas Cowboys Rhythm and Blue Dancers, and also a booked and busy, booked and blessed. I know I screwed it up once before, and I probably just did it again, but he is a talented dancer in L.A., and he gave his perspective as a male dancer and shared his journey, and I thought it was amazing getting to know him and hearing about how he just put all his talents to work to build his career to where he's at today. And then Kurt David was the last interview. You know, he gave some, it was basically like a free speech that he gives to corporations and helping people navigate sudden change. And he just shared um, the basic tenets of his presentation with the podcast. And I just really want to thank him as well for his time. It was amazing being on his From Glory Days TV show. And I'm glad I got the nerve to ask him if he would be willing to be a guest on the podcast because he just agreed with not an issue at all. And it was great to have him. And, you know, we had some some men on the show this year, which would be cool. I mean, I'm hoping that can keep it balanced because there are so many amazing male performers and just figures in our space. So we'll have to keep an eye out for that in season eight. 
But you guys know that, you know, I tend to try to do around 10 episodes at a time. Last week with all the craziness that we're going to just try to, we're not going to overlook it, but good God, let's just please move ahead in a more positive direction than last week went. But I did re-release an episode um, where I interviewed the Goo because the documentary had come out on PBS and I just wanted everybody to kind of have a refresher of my conversation with her about her film, A Woman's Work, The NFL's Cheerleader Problem. I know it's caused a lot of conversation and I think it's good and healthy. I think it's just important that we examine the history of how changes have come about in the NFL space for cheerleaders. And one of the things that I've been wanting to do for the beginning of time, or at least the beginning of time with the podcast, is to explore something that was touched on in the film. What would be the scenario if NFL cheerleaders decided to unionize? It was something that happened with the Buffalo Bills cheerleaders, the Jills, and unfortunately their union disbanded. But this episode is called Union. Apparently the Black Eyed Peas made a song called Union. It always just comes together. But I really wanted to take the time to educate myself, number one, and understand what goes into forming a union. What are the risks? What are the fears, whether they're justifiable or not? And I really just wanted to present you guys with all the information because I'm hoping, you know, as a goal that we can just learn together and figure out if that would be the right direction for NFL cheerleaders to move in in order to get the types of protections consistently across all 26 teams. And it seems like unionization is the answer to me. I mean, I'm all for it. I'm not a current NFL cheerleader, but I just wanted us all to explore the topic together. And so I put together an amazing panel that I'll get into in just a second. But that was one of my goals for this season. I just thought that you know, with all the changes that we've been seeing with uh, coronavirus and watching our opportunities to dance, you know, shift uh, this year, I just think it's just time for us to have a seat at the table. And one of the things that I was hoping for this season was to be able to examine that. And let me just get into the panel. Okay, so you guys already know I talked about Wee Goo, but, you know, she's the film director for the documentary, so I invited her to be part of the panel, and she actually was very helpful in introducing me to Amanda Ross, who is a former Baltimore Ravens cheerleader. She cheered for five seasons. She was voted for a Pro Bowl cheerleader, and Amanda pretty much has been kind of leading the effort to learn about unionization. She invested time with the AFL-CIO, which I should have wrote down what that acronym stands for, but basically they're kind of like a union organizing organization and they provide trainings to help people understand how to form unions. And so she, you know, went to a training, got certified and having conversations actually with the NFL Players Association who extended some assistance in exploring this in terms of NFL cheerleaders unionizing. And so um, we kind of put us in contact with each other, and I was just so on board with helping in whatever way I possibly could. And we've been meeting and talking for the past few months. And so she has been a huge piece of where we are, just in terms of the legwork, um, because there is a lot of research, there's a lot of information out there and things that we needed to understand. And so um, you'll hear more about what we've been doing and where we're at in the process and really the opportunity that's presented to you guys as current NFL cheerleaders. So Amanda Ross is a very, very important and amazing lady that is part of the panel for this episode. And finally, I this is again just a courage in reaching out to people and just hoping for the best, but I reached out to Sarah Blackwell. She is a very, very prominent employment attorney and she's represented countless employees who have experienced unfair working conditions or labor practices, wage discrimination, all sorts of things. And she represented a couple NFL cheerleaders for the Saints and the Dolphins, both Bailey Davis and Kristen and Ware. And I wanted her perspective as an employment attorney because as you look at the history of how changes have come about in NFL cheerleading, unfortunately, it's been because of some struggle and some drama and some lawsuits. Um, but I just wanted to get her perspective on what it was like working with the teams or working against the teams, however you want to look at it in the litigation context, but also to get her perspective as to whether a union would make a difference in reaching some of the same goals that the lawsuits actually did in terms of improving some of the employment practices and the wages, et cetera. So 
this panel could not have been any better than I could have asked for. I mean, we obviously has tons of research from preparing the documentary about what happened with the Buffalo Jills. And so having her perspective on what happened before was huge. And we had an amazing conversation, you guys, and it was just so informative. And then on top of that, it was just inspiring and empowering because we're in a different space. Like I feel like in the last two years since starting the podcast, you know, there were all these taboo topics and people were a lot more afraid of saying things. And I just think we're kind of getting there to where people are less afraid to use their voice. And I think exploring a union is kind of the next natural progression of taking your voice and turning it more into action. And I'm just so thrilled to present this episode to you guys so that you can make an informed decision about whether this is something that that you want to do. And, you know, you'll find out the information in the episode about next steps to have an information session. We're having two of them so that people can ask questions and voice concerns. I posted in the story today, if anybody has questions about unionization, you know, just shoot me an email, DM, whatever, answer the story question. And we'll make a note of it so that we can address that during the information session. It's obviously a chance to learn. So listen to the episode. If more questions come from that, then definitely reach out and do think about attending either Thursday, uh, 5.30 p.m. Pacific time, 8.30 Eastern time, or on Saturday, this coming Saturday, the 16th at 11 a.m. Pacific and 2 p.m. Eastern. So there'll be opportunities to ask questions. Don't be afraid, you guys. Like, it's just a topic It's just an opportunity to shape something amazing in our industry. So let's just, you know, shed the fear around it. It's not the big fat boogeyman. Like we're just going to talk, we're going to learn, and we're going to explore, right? So that's the goal, at least for this episode to wrap up season seven. I'll give you like a preview of what I'm looking forward to for season eight after taking some time actually in between that. So there's going to be, I mentioned it before and everybody was so excited about it. And so it took again, just having the gumption to reach out to people. But I went and shot for the stars with a career panel of some amazing former pro cheerleaders and dancers that would be willing to speak is on a career panel and really provide some coaching, some business coaching. Like I'm seeing a lot of people in our community that are starting their own businesses and and branching out into other things, especially if, you know, our culture living and dance opportunities aren't what they used to be, thanks to the Rona. But it's exciting to see people going off and doing other things. And so I wanted to try to put together a career panel of ladies that would provide some insight into how they turn into these extremely successful business women. You guys, I have like, I have people who are Forbes listed. I was too nervous to say anything before because of they hadn't confirmed but they all reached back out and were just like hands down interested and willing to do it so now i'm going to name drop only because i'm just too excited and i want you guys to be excited too as soon as we get a date established i'm thinking it might be like mid-february that i drop that as a bonus episode but okay so we have pasha carter she is a former um, atlanta falcons cheerleader i mean she is (laughs) i don't even know where to go with it she's the business coach of the year she even owned her own TV network at a point. She, you know, just coaches businesses and entrepreneurs. And we also have Ari Chambers, you guys. If you don't know who she is, please go follow at Highlight Her. Um, she's a former Nick City dancer. And she covers WNBA. She's so passionate about female empowerment and women in sports. And her Highlight Her Instagram just showcases, you know, women and girls of all ages doing dope things with sports and culture. And she was just named on the Forbes 30 under 30 list. Dope. Okay, so she's agreed to also be a part of the panel. And finally, uh, Kelly Roach. Uh, she is another entrepreneurial coach. She has, she's an international bestseller for books in terms of like coaching CEOs. And she has like a podcast, The Unstoppable Entrepreneur Show. She's a former cheerleader for the Philadelphia Eagles. So. These are all people that come from our community that have done amazing things. And I'm just hoping that they will just shed any light that will like light a spark under you to go after your dreams, all of your dreams, not just your dance dreams, but your business skills as well and any dreams that you have in that department. So 
Look for that during the break. There will be a bonus episode with this career panel. And if you have specific things that you want to learn or have asked for these women, please reach out and let me know. I'll be posting about it so you guys will see um, when that's coming up so that you can kind of anticipate that and reach out with anything that you want these ladies to address. But I'm so excited and so thankful to them for just being willing to share their time. It's just going to be amazing. So there's some good things coming. There will be a bit of a break. And then I haven't exactly set when season eight will launch, but I really hope by the time I come back that we have some audition information posted. We have some indication of what the NFL season will look like. And that in the meantime, if there's just a lot of work and support towards whatever you guys decide that you want to do in terms of moving that direction around unionization, I'm here to help and support. And one thing I just wanted to mention is before leading into this episode that you're about to hear, you guys know I'm a passionate little person. <laughs> I can't help it. I, I absolutely love and respect everybody that makes up this pro cheerleading community and this dance community. I think we are all connected in so many ways, whether you're alumni, an aspiring dancer, or cheerleader, or currently on a team. And I just want you guys to know from the bottom of my heart that I, I care so deeply, but I just want what's best for you. You know, I want you to have the best experience. And I just, I'm stubborn and I just sometimes think that, you know, certain things just aren't good enough. You know, I think you guys are worth so much more. And I think that's what, you know, pushes me to have this platform, frankly, so that I can hopefully, you know, amplify your voices and the concerns that you have. But I also know my place, if you will. I'm definitely not seeking, at least with this topic around immunization, you know, pushing for something on your behalf or something that you don't want. Um, there's just a lot of, again, like time and energy and resources and like an investment to actually get the ball rolling, right? And so both for myself and Amanda, I don't want to speak for her, but I just think that we cared enough to just see what we could do to help. Right. But ultimately, if this is something that you guys want, it is something that you'll have to actually dig in and, and hopefully reach out to volunteer and help with because there's work involved. There's some administrative things and and a process to follow. But I just wanted you to know that this is not to like speak for you guys and say that you want a union. I definitely encourage you guys to express interest in it. That is like the initial and most critical step is just by signing an authorization card to say that you are wanting to pursue it. I mean, it's just saying I'm interested in having one. And that is so necessary to have a lot of consensus, not just a couple people here and there, but like overwhelmingly the members of the current NFL children's class to come together and say, this is something that we want to pursue. And that kicks off the rest of the process. And so I just want you to know that I'm not pushing. There will be no union if you guys don't want a union. I'm just trying to present the information to you so that you can make an informed decision. And again, just trying to take having a platform where we have these voices elevated to something where we're now pulling up our seat at the table, having a role where you talk to your teams and the NFL and collectively like sharing experiences of what's the best practice for all the NFL teams. I mean, I've talked about this stuff on Blue in the Face um, with different episodes, so I don't want to bore you guys, but... I think there's just a lot to be gained from understanding, you know, Minnesota Vikings cheerleaders over here do X, Y, and Z, and it's amazing and great. And now Jacksonville Jaguars, the Roar, can also do the similar things. And here you have, like, just everybody kind of rising up to having the best program and experience that you possibly could have. And there's just so much power in it. I just encourage you to listen to the episode with an open mind and be willing to just learn and talk about it and explore it. And if you want to explore further, come join the information session Thursday or Saturday. And I just want you to know I care. I really, really do care. I think you guys put in a lot of work to get where you are. This is the top of the top in terms of our level. You guys have reached the pros. So we should be treated like pros. And I think your voices matter and it's time to put those voices to action. So I really hope that you guys consider it. You sign the authorization card and let's just see where this takes us. So with that, I guess I should just let you get into the episode. Please enjoy. Feel free to reach out with questions and I will keep you informed as to when season eight will drop. 
But keep an eye out for that career panel discussion. It is going to be amazing. Until next time, though, I will see you guys when season eight launches. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. This is the season finale of the Pro Cheerleading Podcast. This is season seven. And this is an episode that I've probably been wanting to do, honestly, since the podcast launched two years ago. Um, just based on a lot of the lawsuits that were happening at the time with NFL cheerleaders. So I finally got together the panel of my dreams to discuss a topic that I think is just absolutely critical to the future of pro cheerleading, specifically NFL cheerleading. But this episode is called Union because we are going to be talking about unionization, just really having a very nice overview of what it is, what it means, how it could benefit us as a pro cheerleading community. I'm just pumped. So I'm going to introduce the panel and uh, then we're going to just kick right in and get into it. So we have Sarah Blackwell. She is an employment attorney based in Florida and she has represented a few cheerleaders and pro dancers, but just kind of helping push forward the issues in terms of our workplace conditions and our rights as employees. And so very excited to have you, Sarah. Welcome. So I also have Amanda Ross. She is a five-year NFL cheerleader for the Baltimore Ravens, also was selected as Pro Bowl cheerleader. She is a school counselor in Maryland and also a certified union organizer. So welcome, Amanda, too. And finally, I have Wee Gu. I've talked about her probably so much in the last couple of weeks, but she is the film director for A Woman's Work, the NFL's cheerleader problem. Her film was just released on PBS last week. And she's joining us as well. So we welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being a part of this, this episode. Super excited to have you. Thank you for having us. Yay. Yeah, excited to be here. Yes. Well, let's just get started. I mean, there's a, a little overview that I was hoping that we could cover just because I think this topic is scary for a lot of people for whatever reason. It sounds very like we're about to go fight and just, you know, take over the world and just go head to head with your employer, but I just think it'd be helpful. What is a union? You know what I mean? Just kind of like high level, what does it even mean? What are the benefits? And just a little bit of context of like other unions that exist and especially in pro sports. So Amanda, can you kind of give a, an overview of that, of what is a union? And because I believe you're part of a union, is that right? Yeah, so I am a part of a union. I'm part of the teachers union for the county that I work in. So a union is an organization um, of people that come together to um, improve their working conditions and to make decisions and have a say in their working conditions where they're employed. And it's really great because it changes the power dynamics. So the employer, when you are a part of a union, no longer has the sole power dynamic in making the decisions. When you are unionized, everything is negotiable. So you can negotiate your pay, your benefits, things like that. And you really have a say in your workplace experience. And so I think for the context of this conversation, the main one that I can think of is the NFLPA um, because that's the Players Association. They are formed, they have a say. Uh, we just saw them negotiate and really talk about when the coronavirus first started and the protections that they were lobbying for and really asking for. And I think that's a great example of the power of unions because prior to that and prior to them unionizing, they really didn't have a say in uh, their employment as an NFL player. Yeah, and I definitely have touched on, especially this summer, you know, the, what the players were pushing for, for, you know, testing protocols and things like that. And I think it's just powerful. I was looking at the structure of the NFLPA and how it actually works. And there's like player reps um, that are voted by the team and they meet annually and kind of discuss the things that they're concerned about. And I think it's a powerful organizing body. I mean, usually I think unions, you people think manufacturing and people who are working at plants and stuff like that. But, you know, the actors and actresses in TV and film have one with SAG and, you know, there's just so many different types and it's not uncommon, right? Yeah, and I love that you mentioned how the players have different representatives from each team, because I think that goes to show like the ownership that you have as being a part of the union, that it's not like other people saying what it is that you want, but it's that you actually have a say, like every team has a player rep 
that goes to these meetings and says like, well, this is what our team is concerned about. This is what we have at our mm -hmm. team. And so they're able to talk and discuss and negotiate and come up with some consistencies across the board that work for everybody. That's awesome. It sounds definitely like a from the ground up, bottom up sort of approach, not like an agenda that's driven by, I don't know, fill in the blank, but it's something where there's just a voice, which I think is probably the most important piece of it. And frankly, in the news lately, I don't know if people um, realized it, but there's, you know, Google employees that are forming a union, Amazon employees. And so um, this is just definitely an organizing tool that I think a lot of employees are looking at across a variety of industries. So it's important protection. So who technically can be part of a union? Who's able to be a member of the union? Can you explain how that works a little bit too? Yeah, so anyone that's an employee can uh, unionize or form a union. So if you are considered an employee, then you can unionize. That's from my understanding. Um, I think it gets a little bit tricky in terms of like independent contractors, but as long as you are an employee, you can unionize. And Makiba, I believe in the state of California, uh, NFL cheerleaders are employees, right? Absolutely. I was just part of a panel that we put together for her film, but uh, Assemblywoman in California, Lorena Gonzalez, but she was instrumental in enacting legislation that made that very clear, I think, as a result of some of the lawsuits. She didn't want it to be a question of whether cheerleaders were independent contractors or employees. She made it statutorily binding, if you will, that that was something that she didn't want it to be a, a hurdle or a burden for cheerleaders to establish that they are employees and are entitled to those types of protections. So that's pretty key. And I believe New York followed suit as well. So it's definitely something that I just wanted to make sure it was like a distinction of whether it's like alumni can be involved or, you know, who all really are kind of like involved in that process. Yeah. Just current, right? yeah. Yes, that's a great question too. Yeah, only current um, employees or current cheerleaders. So unfortunately, you know, former NFL cheerleaders, while like we love their support and like, you know, we definitely want them to help. Um, it's unionizing is really for current employees. So current cheerleaders for that season would um, be able to form the union. Awesome. Okay. Well, I think that's helpful backdrop because I think they're just for some context. NFL cheerleaders did try going this route before in Buffalo for the Buffalo Jills. They are a team that's been covered as part of Wee's documentary. So we, I'd love to kick it to you just to kind of talk us through with all of your research and everything that went into creating the film. What's your understanding of what happened when NFL cheerleaders tried unionizing in the past? Yeah, so I, I think it's a bit of a sad story because I think it just is an example of really history repeating itself. Um, you know, the Buffalo Jills lawsuit that came out in 2014, um, the moment they filed the lawsuit, the class action lawsuit, the Bills and the Jills management actually disbanded the team. So currently we do not have a Buffalo Jills cheerleading squad because of that decision. So uh, if you go back 20 years um, and also the women who filed the lawsuit in 2014 and even the attorneys, they didn't know about this unionization effort that happened in 1995, 1996. So it wasn't until they were doing discovery and they're going into the litigation that they really discovered that this had happened and it was quite shocking. So back in 1995 and 96, the Jills at that time, which actually were mostly veteran Jills and they only had, I think, six um, new members of the Jills, they all came together and decided that, you know, they wanted to unionize and they hired an attorney, James Schwann, who, whom I interviewed in the film, to help them with that process. And they filed a, you know, a complaint to the National Labor Relations Board. And the board came back with the decision that the jails are employees of both the sponsor of the team and also the direct sort of owner of the Jill's cheerleaders. So the way that the bills had structured it after 1985 is they actually sort of farmed out the ownership and the management of the Jill's to another entity, um, a sponsor who would be paying for, you know, all of the different expenses and managing the Jill's. Um, so at the time it was Mighty Taco, which was a taco restaurant chain in the Buffalo area. Um, so the NL, NLRB uh, decided that 
you know, the jails are employees, which again, like you mentioned, is a very important distinction because as employees, they have, you know, certain rights that must be maintained. However, um, they did not find that it was clear that they were direct employees of the Buffalo Bills, partially because of the structure that the Bills had set up in farming them out. And I think going back to uh, Assemblywoman Lorena Gonzalez Fletcher's law, it actually also guarantees that even if you have farmed out your cheerleading team to third party, you're still responsible. You still have legal responsibility towards the Jills as an employer. So I think that really helps out with that situation because in the past that has really been a problem and has been really unclear. So after the Jills, you know, formed the union, they got that certification. They actually joined with the local electrical workers union together because of, um, you know, their experience in, in negotiating contracts and everything. So they actually joined with this larger union to then try to negotiate with the Buffalo Bills and their other sponsors. So some of the things that they're asking for are literally the same things that the Jills in 2014 were asking for. Um, mm-hmm. You know, for example, they were not paid for their appearances at the Buffalo Bills games. Um, so they wanted to be paid. They wanted their appearance fees to be higher. They were paid $25 per hour and they wanted to be $50 per hour. They wanted to eliminate the quota system of selling Jill's merchandise. So um, I'm not sure if this is across, you know, other teams, but for them, their calendars, they actually had to sell, I think, a hundred calendars because they buy the calendars first, like out of pocket, and then they had to sell the calendars in order to gain their money back. So they wanted that to be sort of taken out. And they also wanted the sponsors and the team to take care of their uniform costs and other costs that are related to doing the job and also making the practice facilities safer. So some of these things are just, you know, again, the basic demands or, you know, settings for the job that they were asking for. And unfortunately, that those were the same ones 20 years later that the Jills still were asking for because they had not attained it. So in 95, 96, when the Jills sort of came together and did this, unfortunately, the Bills refused to sign a new contract with the union in place. So, you know, it was, they were really left with the decision to, you know, continue having a union but not have a team and and not be able to dance and and cheer or be able to, you know, dance and cheer on the field and be part of the Buffalo Jills organization. So, you know, there was really dissent that came about in the team. You know, some women wanted to keep the union. Some women just wanted to cheer, you know, wanted that opportunity. And so I think in the end they decided, you know, we still want the team, we still want to be able to cheer and and be on the field and and work with, you know, Buffalo Bills organization and and everything else. So they had to disband the union. And then the Bills sort of restructured the whole deal again, going back to some of the unfair practices that were happening before. And if you look at their newer contract in 1996, it literally references we're going to manage the Jills according to past practices meaning referring to the past practices, the unfair practices that were happening before. And so when you fast forward 20 years later in 2014, that's exactly the language that, you know, stayed in the 2014 Buffalo Jills contracts as well. Wow. So there's a lot to unpack there. It's just important, I think, for historical context to understand like where unions come in and just like what the power dynamic is like, because it's not like, you know, the team forms a union and the Buffalo Bills just welcome the idea with open arms. And they're like, yeah, this is a good thing that we should be doing for you. Oh, we didn't realize that we weren't treating you fairly. Let's fix that. Let's work together towards a common goal and let's just, you know, make change. It creates this tension. They, you know, it sounds like obviously with this attempt to distance themselves from, you know, liability by having like another ownership structure of managing the team, there's just like, we're met with resistance at the end of the day, right? And I think that's why it's so important to have unions that can kind of take that on. I mean, it shouldn't be contentious. It shouldn't be something that you're really having to fight for. But I think those changes, the progressive changes that are needed, unfortunately, aren't really met with open arms, which makes the union and the fight and struggle necessary to get to the point that you have equitable treatment and just 
fair working conditions. The power play is real, I think, and yeah. it sounds like that's what happened with the Buffalo Jills. Although it is history repeating itself, I think now, you know, 20 some odd more years later, I think the thing that has changed is sort of public opinion. And I think when you look at the way, you know, that lawsuit was received um, publicly, to some extent, it was very similar in terms of, I saw there was an article in the Baltimore Sun at that time, randomly, that they're like, oh yeah, you know, this is not a real job. They're just here titillating the fans. You know, they're just jumping around like that's not a job. And then, you know, you see that in 2014, people have similar reactions, but at the same time, you have all these other people who are, you know, embracing this as a fight for labor rights as a fight for women's rights. You have the Me Too movement um, that came up and really is all about sort of women supporting women and, and believing women when they're saying something is wrong or unfair or harmful. So I think you have that, which has definitely changed. And I think that is positive. I think that's a really positive thing now. To me, I think if something like this were to happen again, if a bunch of cheerleaders came up and said, we want to unionize. And, you know, if any of the teams were like, no, you can't can't unionize we don't want to pay I don't know I don't know how well that's going to fly in terms of you know publicity nowadays versus back Mm -hmm. then you know I think back then it kind of really flew under the radar and people didn't really pay much attention to it but I don't think that will be the same now interesting I mean I'd hope not I mean Sarah I'm going to kick it to you now because I think these lawsuits kind of came up around the same time. I think the Buffalo Bills lawsuit like was around, like you said, 2014, 2015, still ongoing actually. Um, but at just as recent as 2018 or so, there were the lawsuits that came up that you were involved with. So I'd love to understand from your perspective in representing the cheerleaders, factoring in public opinion, how the teams responded, how the NFLs responded, how would you characterize where we are and just based on the litigation that's taken place? Uh, you know, from what I saw and what I, in my experience, I agree that we are in a different time. And I, I was very happy with the longevity of the story uh, because with the Saints story and the Miami Dolphins story from my cases, they lasted it quite a long time. I mean, it wasn't a one overnight, you got one television show and it was over. It seemed like the interest was there for a while. Um, I think to fix the issue of, of really getting rid of the team. The best way to deal with that is everyone unionized together because the chances of every team getting rid of all the cheerleaders is a lot smaller than one team getting rid of cheerleaders. However, it's a much harder thing to unionize everybody instead of team by team. But if that is something that would be able to be done, I think doing everyone would be the best way to prevent one team getting rid of everyone because they're trying to unionize. The other thing is when you have one team that's really good, because not every team's the same. Some teams are more respectful than others. So I think that you've got those teams that could really help unionize because I think they'll have more support. And that would help for the teams that are harder and have more of the, what I think is a very sexist stereotype of management. I mean, do it my way. You don't have any rights because you don't deserve them. Um, I think that's a terrible way to treat the cheerleaders. And you know, for lawsuits, just from an attorney's point of view, you don't mm-hmm. lose that right if you unionize. You actually gain rights. Um, so if you're still mistreated in some way, you still have the opportunity to go to court and to bring cases against the team. But if you're unionized, you have more rights and you have more protections. And that's an important thing to understand, too, because I'm hoping, at least, with just more information about unions and what the benefits are that people will see. It's just an added protection and it's an opportunity to your point, you know, with the various standards across the different teams as to how they treat their programs, how they treat their cheerleaders. I think it's just an awesome opportunity to kind of like raise the level so that everybody's on a better space. Like maybe you're cheering for a team and, you know, you're getting the bare minimum scraps just because of what's like whatever legally required in that area. But, you know, you have another team that's in the NFL that have amazing programs and standards and practices. And what if we could just meet somewhere in the middle and just elevate the community as a whole? I think there's a lot of power in that, like you said, of everybody doing it together, because I think the fear of, oh, no, if we do anything to organize, they're going to drop the cheerleading team it loses a lot of that credibility if we're going in all together, for sure. That's a big fear, too, when people are bringing claims against the team. 
the other team members really shun them because of the fear of, great, you're going to get us all shut down. Just keep your mouth shut. So that fear of getting rid of the team also has an effect on people bringing claims. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, obviously with litigation, it becomes contentious, right? So when you file a lawsuit, because I think it's helpful to think about ways of impacting change or making change. It's either you proactively, you know, like I said, in this kumbaya approach where you're just like, let's sit together at the table and talk about some changes that we'd love to see made. And there's open arms, meeting of the minds. That would be like best case scenario, right? Um, right. Once you reach the point of, okay, I'm suing you because maybe I tried that and it didn't work and you're not listening, it creates this, this dynamic. With unionization, what would you say would be, if you were to guesstimate based on just your experience, obviously in the litigation context, but what would you say the re reaction would likely be from teams just based on what you've seen to an effort to unionize? <laughs> what well, that's so funny. I've been a lawyer for like ever and no one's ever thanked me for suing them. I'm like, I'm not your enemy. And they're like, no, you really are actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think when you're coming with a union, an employer is automatically going to be against it. They're going to push back because for one, a lot of people don't know how to deal with it, don't know how to do what is the new. So it adds a whole level to their job. And mm -hmm. people think that if you're doing a union, it's because you want to strike and you want to do all you want to go after them in a negative way. When reality, it's just coming together to bring up the bare minimums of rights. And, you know, I'm sure there are people who abuse the system, but that's going to happen anywhere. But, you know, as a general rule, uh, unions are very helpful. I think personally the cheerleaders should be unionized, but if they're afraid to go to that route or go that far, definitely at least come to the table as a group and say, you know, we don't want to have to union. We want to just work together. We're just asking for these bare minimum of rights and see if you can go that route. If that's something they would want to do. It doesn't hurt to ask. Yeah. Well, I'll just say this and anybody can respond to this. It seems as though just because of, you know, the lawsuits, and I personally saw it where I think because of the lawsuits, there were teams that were wanting to take a look at their programs and make sure that they weren't doing anything that would be a foul of the law if they weren't really aware of the practices of their cheerleading programs and maybe made some changes, made some improvements just to kind of maybe bring themselves in compliance with the law, avoid any kind of stink. So I think there might be people out there that are thinking, okay, we're done with lawsuits. I don't even want to touch a lawsuit with a 10 foot pole. There are you know, people who are upset that women came forward with lawsuits and they think that where we are right now, the problem solved, it's fixed, we're done, Just be quiet. It puts us in a bad light and we just want to move forward and have the opportunity to dance. Is there room, and I, I was going to pose this to you, Amanda, is there room to grow from here? I mean, it's, it's great that we were able to reach this point, thanks to the lawsuits, frankly. I don't think it was something that they were willing to give out and change unilaterally on their own goodwill, these teams necessarily. But now that we're here, where does the union potentially fit in now? And what would be the gains that we would get from it? Yeah, I definitely think that there is still room to grow and unionizing can definitely be extremely beneficial. I mean, even if you look back at the changes that were made, you know, I was cheering when when the lawsuits were going on and I had an amazing experience with my team. Like I don't have very many complaints. Like obviously things are never perfect, but I don't have very many complaints like some of the other teams do. But when I think about my time and when I look at the lawsuits now as a former, when I'm like actually really like, oh, well, let me read these. Like what, what are the lawsuits rather than just kind of brushing them away while I was cheering, um, I am noticing that there were changes that were made that came from the lawsuit. And they were good changes. And even though the lawsuit wasn't directly from my team or organization, I was able to see the change that was made. And it wasn't even very many girls that came forward with the lawsuits, but look at the change and the impact that it has had. And so imagine if all NFL cheerleaders came together and united and talked and discussed the best practices or the things that were missing, like I mean, the, the change that can happen is just amazing when you think about it. And so I do think that we have to shift our, our perspective on unions and not say like, oh, well, we're good now. We, we have the bare minimum because is the bare minimum really what we want to accept? 
right? We worked so hard as NFL cheerleaders. I mean, so many people, including myself, has cheered, danced, or done gymnastics for almost the majority of their life. And so for us to have this mindset of like, well, we just need to be grateful to be there. It's a privilege, you know, to cheer. That doesn't mean that we sacrifice all of the other things um, that we should be entitled to because we wouldn't make those sacrifices on our everyday job. Like we still want benefits and things like that on our nine to five. So why are we not looking for those things in this field of cheerleading that we work in because we are working. And so for the second part of your question, I think some of the things, at least from, you know, what I've been hearing from different teams and things like that, like I think that, you know, pay is always going to be something that comes up. And I think that we're just going to have to kind of go with that and, and see where that takes us to. But even, you know, being protected from sexual harassment, I mean, you saw some of the lawsuits that just came out, job security and job protections, not being able to get fired just because or not getting blackballed from all the other teams just because you spoke up about something or because you you didn't agree with something that happened. I mean, there's so many protections and guidelines that can come from unionizing. And when I heard you say like, well, people are saying, you know, we're good where we are, that isn't necessarily going to last. And that's something too that, you know, I've learned throughout the process of becoming a union organizer and, and talking to different people, you know, they can say with us not being unionized, they can say, oh, we're going to raise your pay by 20% and that's going to be your pay. You know, we're going to, we're going to stick with that. But if next year they decide they don't want to do that, then they don't have to do that. And you don't have a say in that. Whereas if you're unionized and you negotiate and agree, this is what we're going to get paid. This is, you know, what we agree to. Of course, you know, the first thing you go out with, they're not going to say like, okay, yeah, we're going to agree with that. That's what we're going to pay you. But once you negotiate it and, and you talk to them, then you have a better chance of sticking with that payment because they can no longer say like, oh, well, budgets change. Oh, well, we had to cut back here or there. When you're unionized, you can say, well, let me see the paperwork okay, well, let's, let's document this or, okay, well, what changed? You can ask those real questions and not be held at the mercy of the employer. It just gives me chills to think about what that would really look like in our space. I mean, it's almost like every topic that I've ever, <laughs> that I've ever covered as part of the podcast would be addressed. And I just want to say that because, you know, it's been amazing to have a platform to voice these issues and and not about a you know spokesperson for all pro cheerleaders by any means, but you know, just having the visibility or the ability for us to talk freely or me say it on everybody's behalf because people don't feel like they can. I mean, it's great to talk about the issues, but the power in being able to across teams as part of a union to share what's working well, what's not working well, like being able to just that power of information sharing just gives me chills because I think, you know, it's one thing to talk about it, but actually be able to collectively come together and develop a platform for lack of a better word of like what it is that you guys all want to work together to achieve together. There's so much power in that. And I just, it gets me so giddy because I just think otherwise we're just going to be talking about it till we're blue in the face and that's not action. You know what I mean? The I mean, nobody's looking at the podcast as any sort of savior, but I do think in terms of just some of the conversations that I have privately with people that write in about what they're struggling with, I feel very conflicted because I wish there was more that I could do to help. You know, I'm not in a position to, and I just know if we had a union, there would be an organizing body that would be able to um, just flush that out and really push those changes forward. And that's just exciting to think about because that's what we need. It's absolutely what we need. Yeah. And I think that, you know, people have to realize that the union is for them and it's it's by them, really. Like they have the say in this because we are formers. And so to your point, like we can speak freely about this. We can help organize. We can, you know, bring people together and really get that confidential information from people. But we do not know exactly what you're experiencing. Only you know that. And so who better to help rewrite the NFL cheerleader story or journey or um, make those changes than NFL cheerleaders that are experiencing it right now. And when we think about like everyone puts NFL cheerleaders in a way you're like on a level with the NFL players, right? Like this is like an amazing opportunity. Like 
you're on this pedestal in a way and you have younger girls or boys that are looking up to you. And we don't want, or at least I know, I don't want to be in the business of developing cheerleaders, you know, helping young girls and young boys reach this level and then setting them up for failure when we have an opportunity to truly make change for the next generation. Absolutely. Could not agree more. We're all super passionate about our junior programs and you're teaching all of these skills of like speaking up for yourself and loving yourself and all of the things. And this is a, an amazing way to act that out and really preserve the future of our sport. Cause I think that's what I'm passionate about. Definitely with having the podcast is us having a voice and speaking up on issues that will help us in the long run and long term. Um, Sarah, can I ask you, I guess, to the extent this is something that the cheerleaders in the NFL currently decide to pursue. What are the um, protections, I guess, that they have in doing that? Because I think there might be some fear that if they, you know, express interest in joining the union or they join the union, that they could lose their spot on the team or in the organizing process, like how they are protected under the law. Yeah, they have confidentiality protections. They have protections against retribution coming after them for participating in unions. Uh, so there are a lot of protections in the forming of a union. Of course, nothing is fail safe or fail proof because if someone finds out and then they fire you for a different reason, you can't prove really, or not can't prove, but it's hard to prove. So you know, anytime I'm talking to employers or employees, I would tell them all the risks as well as your mm -hmm. protection. But yeah, I think that it's worth it's worth talking about. I think everyone who hears this and is interested should definitely reach out and put their name out there just to say, hey, I'm interested in at least hearing more about it and, and knowing more of my protections and knowing more of my rights and opportunities. And I think once you get that ball rolling, that's that's going to be really a big step. Absolutely. This is the truth behind the palms. And this is a topic, you know, that I've been very passionate about for a very, very long time. And, you know, being connected with Amanda, you know, this is something that we actually have been trying to just meet together and figure out, is this something that's viable? And so we just have been talking and having really, really great talks about how we can help enable this to move forward in any real way for NFL cheerleaders, obviously we're alumni and aren't currently on a team, but Amanda, do you want to share with, you know, the listeners what we have been trying to kind of put together to help this move forward, if that's something that the NFL cheerleaders want to do? Yeah, sure. So Makiba and I have been working for um, a while, actually, on just what it takes to, to form a union, um, what the process is, what protections you have, what protections you don't have, and you know, this really started through the NFLPA. And so, you know, I was able to speak with Dee Smith, who is the executive director of the NFLPA, and he and his team have really, you know, been helping us um, walk through the process as well, as well as the AFL-CIO. And I, I say that because I think it's important that we understand that we have support, that it's not like it's just us that are doing this or pushing for this, other people, and particularly in, in the NFL arena, um, other people are wanting to support us and help us make these changes. So I just wanted to make sure that I pointed that part out that we do have support from other people in the NFL. So the next step really is for you guys to come out and hear more about it. So yeah, we're sharing this right now with you and we're telling you, you know, what a union is, the benefits of it, you know, certain things that can happen, um, the history of unionizing in the NFL. But the next step is for you guys to come talk with us. We have a Gmail, NFLTrueLeaderUnion at gmail.com. We have a website, NFLTrueLeaderUnion.com. And of course, Makiba, I'm sure we'll share all of this um, in the show notes with you guys. But the very next step is coming to an information session and or signing an authorization card. So an authorization card is something that you will need to sign and that we will need to have in order to go to a formal vote. And so what the authorization card shows is that we have support, that we have support from NFL cheerleaders currently that are in the NFL cheering that are saying they want to unionize and they want to move towards a vote. We cannot move towards a vote without support 
and signed authorization cards from NFL cheerleaders. The website has authorization cards. So if you go to nflcheerleaderunion.com, you can sign it right then and there. So if you hear this episode and you're like, I'm on it, I want to sign, I want to support, you can go on there and sign it right now. Or you can attend one of the information sessions with us via Zoom um, that we will have on Thursday the 14th and then Saturday as well at different times so that you can choose which one you'd like to attend. But that is really the first step. So after you sign the authorization card and we show that we have enough support from all of the current cheerleaders, or at least most of them, then we would file petitions with the National Labor Relations Board. And those petitions is bringing all of our authorization cards to the Labor Relations Board and saying like, here, we have enough support. We have enough cheerleaders that want to form a union. And then the NLRB will take that information and they will either approve or deny, but they will go through an investigation and they will make the determination. So it could go a couple different ways. They could say when they look into all the information and look into the employer and all of that, they could say, okay, cool. NFL isn't pushing back. Go ahead. Um, you guys can unionize. Or they could say, well, we need to look a little bit more into a different procedure and you know, figure out what else can happen. But there definitely has to be an investigation um, and determination from the NLRB. Once they determine that we are able to move towards an election, then we can have an election. And that is when we need all of the cheerleaders to come out and vote because having the authorization cards um, and signing the petition is not enough. We need you to come out for the vote because that is really where the real decision is made. If everyone does not come out for the vote and we don't have the correct amount of votes for the election, then we cannot move forward with the union. So that part is really, really important. And I think it's important that when we talk about like the voting and election piece, like Sarah mentioned earlier, and Keeba, I can't remember who said it, but the NFL and the teams are not going to be super happy about this. You know, they're not going to openly say like, oh, that's great. You know, I mean, they might, hopefully it will make things, you know, easier if they do. But the reality is that we probably will get some pushback. And that's important for you to know, because you need to know how to handle that pushback. So again, there are protections under law for people that want to form a union. So like Sarah mentioned, you can't get fired for wanting to form a union. Now, you know, they can make up other reasons or whatever and try to beat around the bush about it, but they ultimately cannot say you wanted to unionize, so we're going to fire you or we're going to get rid of you. And so it's important that you know that. Something else that I've learned that employers might do is they might try to make small changes on a hot topic issue. So I may have mentioned this earlier, but they might say, well, pay seems to be the biggest thing. So let me just give them a pay raise. But remember, that is just a way to get you to not have your power and to not form a union. And that is something that is not set in stone. They can change that at any time. So it's important that we recognize the different scare tactics that that might come up from the employer or even other teammates. If you feel strongly about this and you believe in this and you want to make change for NFL true leaders, come out to our information session, sign the authorization card, learn more so that you can have a say in the future of NFL cheerleading. And that's so important because this is a very empowering moment, I feel like. I mean, it's a very personal decision, I think. And I think it's really easy to be swayed by what your sisters and brothers think, say, feel. The fear can spread like wildfire. But I just encourage everybody to think critically about the issues of the future that you want to see And think of it as just being able to create and be a part of something, because ultimately this would be historic if it were able to move forward and you're actually getting the opportunity to shape what you want this to look like. So there's a lot of power in that. So just really try not to give in to any kind of like negative notions of fear of what will happen if you do this. And even if you're in an amazing place with your team and you think it's the best thing since sliced bread and there's nothing wrong, nothing you would change, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't sign an authorization card saying, I want every NFL cheerleader, brother, sister that is out there to have the same type of experience that I'm having, looking beyond yourself to say, this should be the standard. This program is 
great. Everybody should be able to experience free parking passes, season tickets, and, you know, fill in the blank of whatever it is that your program is amazing for. It's a way of showing support for your program as well, because you might be promoting that this should be the standard that everybody's elevated to or somewhere in between so that everybody can have the same positive and wonderful experience as being an NFL cheerleader. So I just want to underscore the importance of that authorization card. It's not you signing your life away. There's no bulletin board of a public list of everybody who's expressed interest in forming a union. It's really something on the back end that counts towards interest. And it's nothing stronger, you guys, than being able to say, hell, like 90% to 100% of NFL cheerleaders want to form a union than having any sort of fallout or a number that's just not as persuasive. So I encourage everybody just on the basis of this would be a good positive direction for NFL cheerleaders to have a union to go and sign that authorization card, it would be, again, just like that gatekeeping step to be able to pursue this and actually make it happen. So, I mean, I appreciate you laying all of that out, Amanda. The other point that I just want to super underscore is that there is so much support, you guys, like outside of the cheer world, on the player side, there are people who think that this is absolutely necessary. I just remember when we started two years ago, all the articles and research and, and just all the topics, everybody says a union would solve this or a union would address this or they really need to unionize. So it may seem scary in our world, but just know that there is support for you both within it and outside of it as well. Does anybody else have anything to kind of add to that? I just wanted to say it's really an honor, I would guess, because I'm not a cheerleader and never was a cheerleader. I'm really spastic, so no way. But <laughs> Like to be able to say I'm an NFL or NBA cheerleader or I was an NFL or NBA cheerleader, that has to be like the biggest, most proud thing to say. But to be able to say I'm an NFL cheerleader who helped start the union or I was the NFL cheerleader who helped create the union who now for the rest of the time there are cheerleaders, they're all protected because of what I participated in, what I did. And I think that is an opportunity that these cheerleaders right now are getting that I think they should really think about it and take hold of. Um, the other thing is, you know, the, the people I represented, the cheerleaders I represented, they had a lot of other cheerleaders who stopped being friends with them, wouldn't talk to them. They became like an enemy of cheerleaders because they filed a lawsuit against the team or, or against the NFL because of the way they were treated. And with the union, it's different. You're not coming against the team. You're coming together it's a brotherhood, it's a sisterhood. And instead of it being, I mean, it is a little antagonistic um, against the team when you're negotiating, but it's not like a lawsuit. This is not an anti-team or I'm mad or I, you don't have to be unhappy. Um, you don't have to think that, you know, oh, I'm, I'm down and out and I'm mistreated. You can still be happy and join the union. You're doing it to protect everyone, not just yourself. So I think it's, it's important to understand that a union is not like a lawsuit, that it is something you should be proud to be a part of. Not that you shouldn't be proud when you're standing up for yourself in a lawsuit, but it's different. It's very different. Yeah. And I think I found so much encouragement just from looking at other examples of unions that are forming so recently, because it's just been the last month or so. I feel like that, you know, the Google employees and the Amazon employees have come together to form unions. It's amazing to see the page where they do kind of allow you if you're wanting to to post a picture you know stating that you're a member of the union and the pride and the joy I'm serious like in these pictures of just people saying I know I'm, I'm fighting for something that's important and it's a sense of pride and I think it's really something that everybody should be proud of it would be a very very important step and there's no reason why we can't make it happen like none at this point so I appreciate that and I just think everybody for joining and just kind of giving some context to it. I think education is key and learning more if you have questions, if you have concerns, is part of just making an informed decision, right? Or at least an informed opinion about everything. And just knowing that no matter where this goes, you know, media may be taking on to it or picking it up. This is our story and our voice. And I think you can kind of shape whatever that looks like. This would be your union. And I just encourage people to either sign that authorization card or join an information session and let's get this going. Let's do it. Like seriously, it's 2021, all the issues and concerns that we've had, like we don't need history repeating itself. Let's make history and let's make this happen so that we can 
move forward in a way more positive direction for everybody. I love what you said. Do you mind if I just read a quote really quickly? Just yes, because- absolutely. I was reading the open letter, actually, Makiba, that you sent me from um, J.C. Cheddar, the NFLPA president, yeah. when you know the coronavirus first started and when they were negotiating. Because you know, I think that so many people outside of the cheerleading world have a different opinion on our jobs, and they they might try to skew our thought process. And so, when I read what he wrote, and this is what he wrote for the players, but. I just feel like it was so powerful for me to hear it that I'm hoping that listeners and you guys will also feel just as empowered hearing it. But he quoted, um, playing in the NFL is a privilege, not a right. And that is something that people say about NFL players, which is similar to what they say about NFL cheerleaders. And his response to that was, it's neither. It's your job. It is a highly sought after job and a childhood dream, but it is a job nonetheless. You worked your butt off to earn this job, and you have to continue to work your butt off to keep it. Do not allow anyone to undermine the work you put in day after day to earn a spot in this profession. The attempt to frame your occupation as a privilege is a way to make you feel like you should be happy with whatever you get versus exercising your right to fight for more protections and benefits. And so I think that that is just so important because just because we love what we're doing and we're grateful and that there are there are a lot of teams that are doing it right doesn't mean that we forget about the teams that could use our support and our NFL family coming together. Um, so hopefully you guys, that resonated with you as well. Absolutely. I love that whole open letter. I wanted to like read the whole thing during a cheer chat one day. Um, and I think it's a, it's a very important point because that is something that's often used as a tool to kind of silence or dim our voices. It's just like anytime there's a complaint, it's like, you're lucky that you're here and you should just be happy. And I think, you know, in true fairness, I think with this last season with the coronavirus and everybody kind of understanding that our opportunities to dance might be diminishing in some ways that they may feel um, like now's not a good time to speak up, but that's, you just kind of got to flip it because it's the perfect time to speak up. You know, we, we are in a you know COVID-19 era and there are certain protections that we should be afforded uh, if, while we're doing our jobs. And these are just you know little examples, but his, his letter was really powerful. And, and it's great to see that it, that element of fear is something that applies to, to players just as well. I mean, he's speaking to the NFL players to say, don't get tripped up in this and that you feel like you can't speak up because people are telling you, you get paid millions of dollars, you should be happy and be quiet. Um, it's, it applies to us just as well, so. Thanks for sharing that, Amanda. It is empowering and you guys have the power. I think that's what's so like, you just, it makes me energized and jazz because it's like you have individually with your voice and with your intelligence, you guys are amazing people, well-rounded, not just amazing dancers. You have, have jobs, you're building towards your careers. And this is just something that is an amazing opportunity. Yes, to cheer at this level, but you know, use your voice. Definitely use your voice. This is the time. Can I just add one? Yeah, of course. <laughs> I, I, was, I love that quote was so amazing. And I also love what um, Sarah was saying in terms of forming a union is not the same as fighting a lawsuit. It's really about creating that seat at the table, you know, to have that conversation, to really sit together and, and create the future that you want, like you mentioned with Kiba. And I would just encourage people to come to the information sessions because I think in the process of making my documentary what I found a lot of the sort of dissent um, between the cheerleaders was due to misinformation and false information unclear information so I think really now is the time to learn you know to learn what it's all about like what are the different laws out there of protections what what does a union really mean how would it really work step by step and I think after understanding all of that, you know, then you can really sit with yourself and and just think and reflect about what you can do if people have fears at the moment. So I think that is just really important before sort of jumping into conclusions to really take the step to learn and understand. So I think it's great that you both are having those information sessions that's going to be really vital. Absolutely. And attendance at all of those are all we ask is that you're a current cheerleader for the NFL. You know, again, a lot of this will definitely be handled with confidentiality. We're not 
looking to out anybody and as we're organizing and forming and we're hoping for more opportunities to talk to people who are interested on teams. I mean, those are all kind of all next steps that we can talk through in the information sessions, but information is power and it's key to making an informed decision. So let's just kind of go through this together, learn together, share information and concerns with each other, and then just let's get organized. Let's do it. Well, I thank you guys so much. This is like an episode of my dreams. It's the perfect way <laughs> to end um, this season. And I'm just really hopeful for our future. I think you guys have done, each of you, amazing work in this space. And uh, whether everybody's screaming thank you or not, I thank you because I know that these were things that were necessary to tell our story and to push change that needed to happen. So I, I definitely applaud each of you and thank you so much for being a part of this episode today. This was perfection. <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm excited. I, if this happens, can y'all, I mean, you guys are doing amazing stuff. I'm so excited. I went, I'm so honored to be a part of it, honestly. Likewise. I just want you both of you to talk and keep talking about, like, you're just so articulate and passionate and just clear on, on saying, like, what your vision is for the union and the future of all NFL cheerleaders. And that's just amazing and inspiring. So thank you so much. Hey, thank you guys for having me. Um, I really yeah. enjoyed this. You Bye. too. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to the Pro Cheerleading Podcast. You can follow your favorite podcast on social media at Pro Cheerleading Podcast on Instagram, at Pro Cheer Podcast on Twitter. We're on Facebook, on YouTube, and you can support your favorite podcast on Patreon. Until next time, keep your eyes on the sidelines.